Hi, everybody. Morning. 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 So uh, I'm Michael Winslow. Sorry, go ahead. And oh, I'm first. OK, ladies yes, first. Are. All right. <laughs> I'm Catherine Rodriguez. I am a uh, senior engineer at Comcast. I um, have about 18 years IT operations experience. Um, I've been with Comcast for about five years, um, supporting various uh, big data platforms. Um, I now manage uh, the biggest Spunk enterprise platform um, within Comcast, and it's probably one of the biggest in the country. So, oh, fun fact about me, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, it's fascinating whenever uh, people tell me, when I, whenever I tell people that I have a twin sister, so yes, I have a twin sister. And um, I'm a Gemini if you're into that sort of thing also, so. <laughs> uh, this is my uh, Twitter handle and my LinkedIn handle. Um, I am new to the whole Twitter scene, so don't judge me by the number of followers I have. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out. All right, I'm Michael Winslow. I also work at Comcast along with Catherine. Uh, been at Comcast for about six years now as a contractor and an employee. And uh, my fun fact is I am Catherine's twin sister. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I do have a heavy development background, so for anybody who understands this one, I prefer spaces over tabs. Uh, I'm willing to argue that all day. All right. <laughs> Here you go. Take all a picture. Right. You have control. Let's see. Oh, the right one? Yeah. Okay. All right, some background. So I was on a dev team and we, uh, were, we created services using Spring MVC. All right, and I was on the Splunk team um, managing the logging, observability, also assisting users with their queries and dashboards. At some point in time, some of the uh, more senior developers and leadership made a decision that we were gonna move to microservices. Well, things worked out well, but it wasn't always perfect, so. So this is the fun part. This is where we can actually get the audience involved a little bit. Uh, these days on Netflix and all these, there's the uh, choose your path options. So would you rather hear us talk about lessons learned, things that you guys can actually implement yourself, or you just wanna hear about what a great team we have and how great we were at making microservices? Would you rather the red, which is our lessons learned, or the blue pill, which is how great our team is? Anyone? All right, well, too bad, it's our presentation. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> we, did, <laughs> we didn't do this alone, so there's no way that we would feel comfortable not at least giving a shout out to our team uh, back in Philadelphia and our, all our remote people that uh, helped us put it together. Um, this is a slide that I use in a lot of presentations, that's why I'm in, it, in most of the pictures, but uh, this is a good representation of our team members back uh, in Philadelphia, and if you, there's Kathy right there, <laughs> and then we have a special guest in the audience right here, Christopher, <laughs> you know, who came along for the ride. So, there we go. Uh, All right. So we are based out in Philadelphia, Center City. We are in the Comcast Technology Center, and yes, Comcast is a technology company. <laughs> Just real quick about as far as about oh, being a technology yes. company. Exciting news recently, I don't know if you've read it, but we have named a CTO recently. His name is Matt Zalesko. So Matt, if you're watching, love having you as a CTO and excited to where we're going in the future because every tech company should have a CTO, right? <laughs> All right. And this is just an example of our work area in the new Comcast Technology Center. We're all really excited about working there. It opened uh, for us uh, last November in 2018 and uh, we're all pretty much moved in by now. Yep. And that is enough about Comcast. <laughs> you know, there's not, it's not a sales pitch about Comcast. All right, so let's talk microservices. Um, Mike will take this over. I'll take this. So microservices, what I like to do is make sure that I don't assume that everybody knows all the ins and outs about microservices. So I like to break it down, do a little bit of 101 uh, at the beginning of the talk so that we can talk about the pros and cons later. So one great thing that you'll find out on the internet when uh, people want to ask the question, does your team need to move to microservices? There's this great flow chart that's out there that basically says, are you Netflix? No, no. And uh, <laughs> you know, that's the answer. But uh, that's kind of joking. There are some large enterprise reasons uh, to move to microservices. We'll go over a couple of them as we explain pretty much the difference between uh, your classic monolith and microservices. So this is your uh, classic VM or container. Uh, we're gonna start with just a box here. 
And, uh, you know, coming up, we always called this a service. But as microservices came along, they decided to rename this to the monolith. It's slow. It's, it can't be changed easily. It's, uh, it's, it, it moves slowly. So what would happen in your classic monolith as far as a uh, web service is an HTTP request would come in to the monolith. It would hit a controller. That controller would then talk to a service layer. The service layer would talk to a repository layer, and that would talk to the database. Now, one unique thing about the monolith is that all of your endpoints are defined in the controller of this one particular monolith. And if you've written these the right way or, or in a good uh, patterned way, you'll also have matching uh, eligibility user and device uh, serve in the service layer and then also in the uh, data access layer or uh, the repository. And then a lot of times those will be matched with eligibility table, user table, and device table in the database. Uh, it doesn't always work out exactly like this, but this is a good example of what a monolith would look like classically. All right. So this is your microservice. Now it's represented by a smaller box, but what we've found is very often microservices themselves, because of the overhead of some of the boilerplate code, often are larger file size than your monoliths that you started with. Uh, our example was 78 megabytes was our monolith, 125 megabytes was each of our microservices. Uh, that's a, an interesting fact about microservices. They're not always smaller, they just have a smaller scope of what they do. So compared to what we saw before, an HTTP request will come in, and very specifically, this microservice handles all the device traffic, okay? And it still has a controller, it still has a service layer, and it still has a repository layer, and it has its own database layer, okay? And that's uh, repeated for all of your microservices in, the, in that pattern, okay? So what you'll find is if you have a large organization with a lot of developers, and you want to be able to logically split those developers up into their own silos to do work, so that uh, people working on the eligibility service can move a little bit independently from the people working on the device service, for example, this may be a good pattern to follow. Uh, rather than having a team full of developers all working on the same monolith and stepping on each other's toes when they're coding, okay? So let's move this over to the side. In order to make the microservices act like the monolith did, you have to have a single point of entry. And that single point of entry is the API gateway. And you've heard uh, earlier people talking about uh, API gateways in uh, AWS. Um, in our uh, case, we actually created, uh, everything that we did was on the internal cloud, and we created our own API gateway using the Netflix Zool uh, open source library. Okay, so Zool is uh, a, a software-based gateway. I love the name, it's based off of the old Ghostbusters movie where Zool was the gatekeeper, if you guys remember that. Uh, so that's a good way to remember that Netflix Zool is the software that handles the gateway. All right, so let's continue on the, the path and one of the things that you wanna talk about is scale and service discovery when it comes to microservices. So what is that? Let's say for example, oh no, we found out that the eligibility microservice is getting three times as much traffic as any other microservice that you have in your system. So how do we handle that additional traffic? Well, we can actually create multiple elig eligibility microservices and to handle the additional traffic. Now, when those new microservices come in, they need to be discovered. Now, Netflix's way to do this is a library called Eureka. Eureka is the discovery service that discovers the new microservices. Okay, once it realizes there are new microservices deployed, it will extend the API gateway to include those microservices. That's how you get uh, additional microservices be behind a gateway. Now, th in addition, Netflix has something called Ribbon, which actually says we have three identical types of microservices. Let's make sure that we load balance between the three when we get calls for the eligibility microservice. Okay, so, Scalability uh, is another thing that we've talked about before. When you run on your own internal cloud, like, like we have, we had to deploy these additional microservices manually and allow the discovery service to find them and add them to the gateway. As explained earlier, if you go with somebody like AWS, whether it's microservices or serverless, uh, there are ways for them to be able to put thresholds on your traffic and expand out uh, better. That's one of the main, uh, uh, reasons to move to microservices is the ability to scale up and scale down based on traffic. All right, so let's talk about fault tolerance 
and a circuit breaker pattern. If you've heard these terms before, we'll, we'll, we'll go into exactly what those are. So let's say behind one of your uh, eligibility microservices, the database goes down. That causes your eligibility microservice to stop responding, and the API gateway is gonna try several times to try to get that. And when it realizes that it's failed, bye Felicia, it'll kick it right out. <laughs> and Hystrix, Netflix Hystrix, is what handles that circuit breaker pattern. So when we talk about another benefit that comes with microservices, what it is is this good fault tolerance, uh, this graceful handling of errors. As you can see, just because eligibility or one of the eligibility microservices had problems, it doesn't cause your entire group of services to stop functioning like it would in a monolith. Okay, so a summary of what we just went over. We went over the difference between a monolith and microservice. We went over Zool as used as an API gateway, Eureka, which is a service discovery, Ribbon, which is software load balancer, Hystrix, which is the circuit breaker pattern. So now we have a chance to choose again. Uh, so <laughs> you don't get as many choices, but you do have the uh, illusion of choice here. So are you guys ready to actually go in and see what lessons we learned along the way? All right, thank you. The red <laughs> pill, finally. All right. So, um, okay, so this is a quote uh, from one of our colleagues here. So being able to scale and distribute your application resources is certainly alluring. However, this doesn't come for free. Be uh, complexity begets complexity. Soon tools are needed to manage complexity, then you need those tools to manage the tools. So, there's a, Love uh, that one. Yeah, it's <laughs> a great quote. All right, so we're gonna go through the scenario where we need to call an API to determine if a user is eligible to purchase a device. And we're going to talk um, about how this scenario works through the monolith and how it works through the microservices. And we're really interested in seeing how many syslogs is generated between both the monolith and the microservice. So we'll start with the monolith. So um, what we have here, these dotted lines, they represent process boundaries. Now whenever we cross a process boundary, a syslog entry gets created. So this red dot here represents a syslog entry. And you're gonna see these red dots um, coming through here shortly. So as we hit the, um, the, uh, the monolith uh, through the eligibility controller, um, it hits the eligibility service and for processing. And then the first piece of information that it needs is the user information. So it goes to the user service, which then goes and makes a database call. So as you can see here, it crosses another process boundary, new syslog entry created. So the same goes for the device information. They call the device information, calls the database again, makes another syslog entry. So that makes three syslog entries for a simple call. So what does this look like in the mi microservices? The first thing that you'll notice is that there's a lot more process boundaries. So we know that there's gonna generate you know, a lot more syslogs. So how many are they gonna generate? So first thing that we do before we even hit the uh, API gateway is create another syslog entry. So crosses another process boundary before it hits the eligibility microservice. And then because uh, microservices communicate via HTTP, it can go right back out of the API gateway back in to get to the user microservice, generating two more syslog entries. So the same goes to make the database call, calls the device information, same way. So it was keeping score. We have a total of eight syslog entries as opposed to three in the monolith. So it's about three times worth as many logs. So that's something to consider when you want to switch over to microservices because you're going to have a huge increase in logs. All right, so um, another thing to note, we're not gonna dig too much into this here, but the, um, the increased number of process boundaries will also create more security vulnerabilities because now you have more places where pe people will try to come into your infrastructure through multiple microservices. Mm -hmm. So what you ask, microservices inflate system logs and low security risk, so what? Well, it's <laughs> totally, it might be totally worth it, but we're not done yet, so. Um, what about execution errors? Are they easy to track in a microservice? Not so much. Um, so let's say you have an exception in a monolith. We're gonna go through this exception scenario here um, where we cross the eligibility controller to the eligibility service to get the user information and boom, we have an exception in the user repository. Here you'll see a stack trace um, error on the monolith. And we know that the variable username is null it happened in the user repository, which was called by the user service. 
called by the eligibility service and the eligibility controller. So we can literally step back, step to the beginning of the, um, of the, of the trace message um, or the call as it came into the monolith. Um, why is that? Because the stack trace has visibility of everything inside the monolith. Now this is different in microservices. So when we hit the API, we're going to repeat the same exception scenario where we hit the eligibility microservice, come back in, call the user microservice, we have an error in the repository. What does the stack trace look like here? You see that we have the, um, the error message here, but we only see the information within the user microservice. Why is that? Because the stack trace only has availability, visibility of the current microservice. So it, it doesn't know who called the user microservice and uh, what process. So all the context is lost from the eligibility microservice. So the, the solution to that problem <laughs> is distributed tracing. So um, distributed tracing is a way where we can kind of correlate the events as it happens through the microservice. Um, oh. So I can talk a little bit about the, the history of it before we go back and you can walk them through it. Sure. So I, I don't like to get into all the dates, you can do your own research, but distributed tracing started from a paper that uh, Google created a couple of years ago called Dapper. Uh, this is way before they actually wrote the code for it, uh, they actually just created a paper for it. That was followed by Twitter creating uh, actual code called Zipkin, which is a distributed tracing uh, open source project. And we have our own distributed tracing open source project at Comcast called Money uh, that, that came along. And then uh, as recently as I be th believe three weeks ago, uh, Google Open Census and Uber's uh, open tracing came together to create open telemetry. So there are options out there for distributed tracing. And by the way, uh, another colleague of ours, we love giving shout outs to our colleagues, who was the main writer of Money is uh, Paul James Cleary. He's on Twitter. If anybody wants to ask any very specific questions about him, uh, uh, his application, and wants to pick his mind, please feel free. He's, he'll, he's a very open guy. He'll tell you all about it. All right. So um, microservices, this is a quote from one of our, another qu quote from one of our colleagues. Um, that says microservices does not introduce the need for distributed tracing, but it certainly increased the need. Now there's a caveat to this because, again, this will increase the number of logs that are generated. And we need to be able to, um, as an operations team, we need to be able to support this type of, uh, this type of implementation because, you know, especially with on-prem, we have scaling issues to think about. Um, so, um, <clears throat> The stack trace, you see that it generates um, one app log entry in the monolith. Um, how many app logs do you think will it generate in the microservices? Let's find out. All right, so we, we're gonna repeat the same error uh, scenario here, but this time we're going to add a correlation ID. The correlation ID is going to um, help us be able to trace where the call came from and where the error actually, actually happened. So here we'll hit the eligibility controller. We uh, see a, um, it starts processing. We see that it generates some logs. We have the correlation ID. Um, it continues processing, creates more logs. Um, then it goes down to the user repository and that's when it's the error happens. So here you see um, about a total of seven app log entries created. So within this example, this, um, <coughs> Microservices can generate up to four times as many logs as opposed to a monolith. So this can pose um, issues when you want to switch over to microservices, but we have on-prem and limited infrastructure. And I don't know about you, but it takes forever to scale our infrastructure. So, so it, it gets a little difficult there. If I could just add uh, one thing about that. So uh, four times was based off of taking one monolith and breaking it down into three microservices. This is actually a function of how many microservices you break it down to, so the logs can actually grow even much more than that. Absolutely. Uh, for that. All right. All right. So, uh, so let's talk about um, a few more things. Uh, thank you for going so in depth on that. These ones we won't go as far as in depth uh, about, but they're good conversation starters for teams that are thinking about moving to microservices. 
So what you used to do for one, you now have to do for many. This chart you see right here, it's not important to know exactly what every box says, but uh, what, what we should say is this represented all the greens that we had uh, for um, our monolith. Basically, in that case, our code review and, and continuous in integration was all taken care of, but it's not in all the microservices. Continuous deployment to all environments, not taken care of. Firewalls and observability, you all, all of a sudden might find out what used to be very easy to communicate between in a monolith is now getting stopped by firewall constraints in microservices, and then security scans for all of our code. Uh, real, real quick time check. Oh. Okay, great, great. So I was moving fast through that. I thought we were a lot shorter. All right, so some suggestions at this point. So what you want to do is not create all your microservices at once. We, we made that mistake. We own it. It was a pretty painful getting back to write again. Uh, don't create them all at once if you're moving from a monolith to microservices. What you might want to try to do is monitor the usage of your endpoints. And whichever ones are getting the most traffic as a monolith, try making a project to basically port those over to microservices. Use something called a strangler application pattern, if anybody's heard that uh, before, which is basically keep the monolith running at the same time as your new microservice. And if your microservice fails for any reason, fall back to the monolith until you get the microservice working. Then shut off the traffic to that particular endpoint to the monolith as you move over. And then the third thing is create a template for each of your microservices and use it. What you do not want to do is count on your individual developers to come up with their own pattern each time they add a microservice. It's going to be terrible to maintain, terrible to operate over time. All right. We had a big change management team, okay, and they wanted release notes. Release notes were very easy with the monolith. It was one code uh, uh, repository and it was one uh, artifact that was created. Now you have an artifact for as many microservices as you have. We actually had to create a whole application that generated release notes for us to basically keep up with all the versions of microservices that, that came out, all of the code scanning that had to come along with it, as well as all of the um, security uh, QA uh, analysis that, that came along with it. So that was another lesson learned along the way where if you have a very strict change management team, uh, make sure that you consult with them and see what they'll want from you as an artifact once you move to microservices. Uh, more from the security team. Vulnerability scans uh, were an issue for us. Here's an example of a piece of our uh, release notes where it shows all of the security scans, and we used a, a product at the time called Veracode. Um, they, each of our microservices had to be at least a score of 95 or above, and we had to show that in our release notes. Imagine having to run all these scans manually. It's very painstaking. We had to come up with automation just to run the security scans. All right, version control and compatibility. This was a huge one. So if you notice in the upper right hand corner, uh, that's what we used to always deal with when you have monoliths. You had one release of your product and that was your version of your software and that was the version of your release. In this case, it was 1.5.7. But when you move to microservices, releases are only the aggregate of all of your microservice versions. Okay, and those microservice versions can move independently of the release and independently of each other. So as if you do three additional releases of your device diagnosis microservice, means nothing to the movement of your other microservices. So basically you have to keep very close track to uh, the configuration of your microservices and how they all work together. Okay, so a good point brought up by one of our mobile uh, Android developers in, in that case, he says in an article, when you publish a version of your mobile app, the old version doesn't just magically go away. Why does he say that? Because when we were creating the microservices, we started thinking this idea of versionless, okay? That, that there is no rollback, we don't have multiple versions running at once. Um, the problem with that is, that's great for web applications when you're con in control of everything from the HTML down to the back end service, but for mobile apps, when you have to rely on the user to download a new version, what do you do then? Do you just get rid of your old version of your services 
and then all of a sudden they start experiencing errors, it's not a great thing to do. So you want to make sure that you have an idea of how you're going to version things when you move to microservices. Okay? And then finally, burnout is real. Okay? And, and we definitely found that uh, when, uh, when we moved to microservices. And it's so real that recently the World Health Organization has made it an official condition. Uh, so basically, if anybody wants to look it up, it's QD85. Uh, use that as justification. Take it to your boss. <laughs> <laughs> but burnout is a real condition. Um, I would say, uh, as a suggestion, if you are a leader or you're talking to a leader uh, who's thinking about moving to microservices, take these things into account. How important is the success of this project in a short period of time? You know, if your project must be successful and you only have a month to deliver or six months to deliver or even a year to deliver, think about it before you say, let's move to microservices at the same time as, give, as putting out new features. Um, it may not be something you want to tackle just yet. All right. So I think we'll close out with some do's and don'ts uh, and then we'll get into some, some questions. So let's recap. Do have a reason to move to microservices, whether it's resiliency, breaking up the team in certain ways, or scalability. Don't just practice resume-driven development, okay? And that's, that's a real thing. People say microservices is the hot buzzword. Let's do it just because that'll make everybody on the team more valuable. Don't do that. <laughs> do communicate with all your teams about monitoring telemetry and distributed tracing. As I mentioned before, when you have an operations team like me, I'm part of the Splunk team where we handle a lot of the log aggregation. We need to know that you're going to be switching over to microservices so we can plan accordingly in terms of capacity. So don't count on traditional logging techniques like the stack trace because it's not going to give you all the information you need from the, from the microservices perspective. Yes. Do try to peel off one microservice at a time. That's called the strangler application pattern. Don't try to refactor everything at once. It's a huge undertaking. And do understand that all teams are impacted. I don't know about you, but I do not want to get wake, woken up at 2 in the morning when some, of, when some of our servers are overloaded because the dev team didn't tell the ops team that they switched over to microservices. Uh, please don't say, we're doing microservices, you only live once. That is like the worst <laughs> thing you can say. <laughs> uh, a quick funny story on the side. I still remember the day when Kathy came over to us, and I just think of it because I had no idea what the term meant, but she says, if you keep growing the logs like this, I will not hesitate to trim your logs. Right. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but it doesn't sound like something <laughs> I want you to do to us. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so a lot of times when we do have an influx of logs, we kind of reach out to the product teams and we, you know, we try to say, hey, you know, you, you have way too many logs coming into our environment. So we try to uh, recommend either sampling or um, lower retention. And sampling, uh, you know, it, it works depending on what you want to measure, mm -hmm. but it, it takes away the whole uh, tracing. So um, those are the two things that we try to introduce <laughs> as yes. suggestions. She will trim your logs. Yes, I will yes. trim your <laughs> logs. <laughs> do staff appropriately and monitor employee health, and do not ignore the human impact of your decision if you're in leadership or, or uh, a, a dev deciding to move your team over to microservices. Please don't ignore the human factor. All right, and then finally. Do encourage DevOps teams to pursue microservices only if there are benefits. Please don't underestimate the time, effort, and money involved in moving to microservices, okay? And with that, we say thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. All right. We'll let the microphones over here so I <laughs> oh, okay. Do we have any time for Q&A? Yeah. Okay. Any questions, guys? Thanks guys very much. That was a really awesome presentation. I was intrigued at the, um, you know, the focus on uh, the notion of burnout, paying attention to the health of your teams. Any lessons learned or things that you guys did in your journey, in your projects to actually, you know, help, help that? Yeah, so most of the things that we talk about in here are the lessons learned, and if they were in place, it would have been a much easier environment to work in. 
Uh, that one chart that I showed you with all the red sections right there, playing catch up at that time was horrible. And, I'll, and I come from the, uh, from the development side, and I'll admit that was horrible for the operations team to catch up with our decision uh, to move to microservices. Firewall issues that, that kept coming up were, were, were terrible. Um, not having the, the correct uh, environments in place for integration, QA, staging, and things like that. Those were all things that basically had to pull a lot of operations people out of bed at night and have them work on things. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, one second. Uh, my organization took a brief foray into the strangler tactic that you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken a different path now where we're actually just doing a whole almost soup to nuts rewrite. But I was wondering if you had any more comment on was that a lesson learned because you tried to carve it off and it worked well, or was it you tried to switch all microservices at once and it turned into a giant carnival of fun? <laughs> yeah, so we tried to do it all at once, and that I that's what I would recommend against. Once we did uh, carve them all uh, up separately and then got into a pattern of doing the strangler pattern for uh, all new microservices, we found that to be much better. Especially, like I said, if you come up with a template for your microservices and you use it dogmatically, it helps so much. Don't, don't have any of the developers have to make their own decisions on how to implement these things or anything like that. Give them something to start off with and just let them go in and start coding the business logic. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you guys very much, appreciate you. Thank you, Michael, thank you. Thanks.